Hello, everyone, and welcome to Sage Advice. Uh, this is the segment where me, Greg Tito, speaks to Jeremy Crawford. Hello. Hi. How's it going? Great. It's good to be here. Good to have you back. Uh, we will uh, dive into your brain uh, to find out all about uh, some D&D rules as well as some of the philosophy behind those rules. That's what these Sage Advice segments are all about. And today we're going to talk about monster customization. That's right. How to make the monster inside you more custom made. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is suddenly becoming very therapeutic. Exactly, right. right. We're yeah. going to actually talk about the monster. Would you like me to lie down uh, as, yeah. as we discuss this? <laughs> yes. Tell, tell me about your inner monster, Greg. <laughs> well, it's got like three eyes. Uh, it can fly around. It predicts the future. Mine, mine is like one of those... Uh, those little ugly dolls. So, you know, like three eyed and purple, but if you give it a hug, it's cuddly. And you're like, oh, it's, it's kind of got some cuteness to it too. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. see that. Yeah. Uh, so well, let's let's embrace this topic, shall we? <laughs> <laughs> our, our inner monsters. Our inner monsters. <laughs> yes. Uh, so yeah, there uh, obviously there's tons of monsters I available for Dungeons and Dragons in our in our monster manuals and and uh, Volo's Guide to Monsters as well as other supplements. Um, but we always consistently get that feedback of like, how do I make my own monster, or how can I change the power level of monsters that are there? Exactly. And and there are really two different categories that people are in when they ask that question. One category is, I'm designing something for DMs Guild or maybe even you know hoping to design something officially for the game. Mm -hmm. How do I make a monster that's going to appear in a product? The other category are the people who are just DMing D&D &D and they want to do that special thing for their table. It might be a monster that appears only once and you know never shows up again. It might be a special feature of the campaign they're running where you know they want a particular villain or a group or a big beast that's going to be a recurring element and they're like, "Well, how do I do it?" Yeah. So today I want to focus on that second category. Okay. So this is not for the designers out there. This is for dungeon masters. Of okay. course, Every dungeon master is, in some ways, a game designer. Uh, but I'm really wanting us to, to dig into how can you make monsters your own as a DM, demystify it, and really encourage everyone to be lazy about it. Uh, because I think people get really uh, concerned about, are they doing it correctly? Mm. And what I want us to really delve in today is it's pretty easy to pull it off, have your players have a good time, and not have to do a whole lot of work. And that's the and that's the real goal, right? It's not necessarily to do it quote unquote cor correctly or as if you know Jeremy Crawford was designing this or something like that. It's best to do it in a way that makes uh, you know your experience and your players' experience fun at the table. Exactly. So a few a few sort of uh, foundational things to keep in mind, DMs, when you're making your own monsters. Uh, for your group, this is again, as opposed to a monster you might be writing for something that's going on the DMs Guild or mm -hmm. whatnot. It's just your players are, are really the only people who are going to run into this thing. One, they can't see behind the DM screen. So they don't know if you're quote unquote breaking the rules or not going by the book or not following challenge rating guidelines. Mm. So you can let go a little bit. Uh, all they know is what you describe and what they're going to encounter in combat or in a non-combat situation. Because sometimes the creatures we create for a particular adventure, you never fight them, but instead you might have some weird riddle-filled conversation with them. Mm -hmm. uh, or you might go to a, a strange masquerade in a haunted castle and you suddenly find yourself you know, dancing with this multiple tentacled, multiple eyed critter that's not hostile, but you have to figure out the right dance steps with it uh, to find out where the treasure is. Nice. Uh, that creature that I just described, which just popped right out of my head, we don't have that creature literally in any of our books, Yeah. but it's pretty easy uh, to just make that thing happen. So again, Remember, your players can't see behind your screen. Mm -hmm. Next, sort of ground rule DMs, if you don't have to, don't make anything new at all. Reskin, reskin, and reskin some more. Mm. A big advantage of your players not being able to see behind the screen is they have no idea if you grab a Modron stat block, for example, and use that stat block 
to represent a creature that you describe as maybe a walking jack in a box mm. uh, or a animate snow globe or even a giant pig. Uh, they they have no idea unless they're like peeking over the screen and they can see what page you're open to in the monster manual. And in that case, you just need a taller screen. Yes, taller <laughs> screen. Or this is one one reason why I like. Um, screen capturing uh, stat blocks from D&D Beyond, and then I'm putting them in my Microsoft OneNote. Mm. Uh, so then my stat blocks are on my laptop screen uh, when I DM, and uh, then my players can't see what, what stat block I'm using for the weird thing I just described to them. And that's an important thing to note is because, you know, you can you'd essentially use any monster uh, and, and describe it differently and use the mechanics for, for that monster. And, you know, your players will never know the difference and it'll feel just as well as long as you can describe it in a way that, that makes sense to you and to the players. Yeah. So, so one thing I do all the time when... I want to introduce a little twist in my campaign. I want to keep my players on their toes is I will grab a stat block that's close to the thing I want, describe it however I want, uh, and they often never know I'm just using, I might be using the Hobgoblin stat block for the third time in the campaign, but the first time it was actually a Hobgoblin, uh, the second time it was a walking human-sized toy soldier, and you know, the third time uh, it might have been, I don't know, an animate candy bar. You know, I haven't actually done that. But uh, if your players can't see the stat block, they don't know what that thing is. We, we started this by talking about your inner monsters. And so far, out of the eight examples that have come out of your head, they've all been like walking toys that are very <laughs> creepy. So now, now I want to know what's going on in Jeremy's head. <laughs> well, in... in uh, in my gothic horror campaign, I I do occasionally have animate <laughs> toys because there's something scary about it. There them. is, there is for yeah. sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, what you can also do that's sort of adjacent to reskinning, uh, pure reskinning is you don't change anything in the stat block at all. You just simply change the description of the monster. Right. Sort of adjacent to that is taking an existing stat block maybe change the description, and then maybe change a detail or two. I do that a lot, too. Mm. Uh, and right here on the table, I actually have uh, Morden Kanan's Tome of Foes open to a page uh, where I did exactly this in my home campaign uh, within the past year. Mm -hmm. In my home campaign, there was this, again, this is going to go along with the theme of strange, animate things. <laughs> <laughs> my... My uh, player characters, they arrived at the bone grinder windmill that's in Curse of Strahd. Okay. However, t this is 200 years after Curse of Strahd, and the story is that the hags holed up inside that windmill. It was surrounded. It was set on fire. And as a last-ditch last effort to save themselves, they performed a ritual to try to phase the windmill into the Feywild. Okay. So what happened then 200 years later, while my group was making their way there, is they encountered a ghostly version of this windmill, sort of out of phase, like it was partially in one plane of existence and partly in another. Yeah. And the hags had all turned into these strange spectral forces and I decided I wanted them to animate the windmill itself. Oh. So often when I'm creating an encounter, I do this in my home game. I do this also in Acquisitions Incorporated. I'm always thinking about, like, what's the set piece? What visual thing are my players going to take away from this scene that's going to make it memorable? Yeah. Uh, and often that memorable thing is not a game mechanic. It's often a story element, a description. An odor. A, an odor, a joke. And so the thing I wanted here was I want them to fight a windmill. Uh, and so, again, the conceit being that this, this coven of hags had, like, essentially disintegrated themselves or turned themselves into this ghostly form along with their windmill as they tried to phase it into the Feywild. And now they're sort of merged with the windmill and animating it. So, sure, I could have created a stat block for... An animated windmill, but this is for my home game, right? And I make 
I make stat blocks for a living for D&D books. Yeah. So in my home game, I actually like to model the advice that I give everyone else, and that is be lazy when possible. Because <laughs> this is, because this is again, my home game is for fun. It's just to enjoy. Yeah, you don't want to be spending you know hours and hours and hours prepping and creating new set blocks for the thing that you want to just enjoy around the table. Yeah. Now, I do have to say, if I didn't work on the game, I probably would create the stat blocks, but it's just, I, in my job, get to scratch that itch of, because I actually love making monster stat blocks. Sure. And there are tons of masters who love doing that too, so always Ab follow Follow your bliss, follow man. Follow your bliss. <laughs> yes, always. Uh, but I was being I was being lazy. And yeah. plus, I knew we had just created a stat block that would give me exactly what I want. And that is, well, it's actually two stat blocks. I have Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes open to. And that is the stat block of the Eidolon and the Sacred Statue. Mm. The Eidolon is a spirit in Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes that animates this big statue and then, you know, stomps around. It's, you know, this large construct uh, wreaking havoc. Mm -hmm. So what I did is I just took these two stat blocks and described the Sacred Statue as a windmill. And, you know, I, rather than it being large, I had it gargantuan and... Uh, then for the sort of spirit form of the hags, I used the Eidolon stat block. But I also did a s other slight tweak because I wanted this big ghostly windmill to also be on fire because mm. what a cool image of the windmill going around and there being ghostly Smoking, flames yeah, on yeah. it and everything. So I thought, well, the ghostly windmill, surely it's going to shoot fire. So all I had to do is, looking in the sacred statue stat block, one of its attacks is a ranged attack where it hurls a big rock. So instead, I just had the windmill throw a ball of fire, use this exact rock attack, and changed the bludgeoning damage into fire damage. Dun, dun, dun. That's it. That's it. And I have, I have uh, a couple of members of uh, our company, uh, including Chris Perkins in my home game. None of them had any idea that... The big spectral flaming windmill was just a monster we had published, and I just reskinned it. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's what's crazy that people even have the familiarity familiarity that they have with the game that Chris and, and other folks do to be able to. They're, 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 everyone wants to suspend their disbelief when they're playing Dungeons and Dragons, so no one's going to be like, "Oh, is, are they using that monster?" But like, it doesn't matter as long as you're in, and I'm sure you did describe it evocatively. Yes, and that it. And this is sort of a it's a it's a tip not only for DME but for really any uh, performance, and that is commit. <laughs> you know, if you're if you're going to do it, commit to it. Yeah, right. Don't, if you had, if you had said like, um, oh, and I guess it's uh, blood. No, not bludgeoning. I guess it's fire damage. <laughs> right. Then it would start right. to. But if you did that from the beginning and you just had the the gusto in, in how you were talking about it, then there's no reason to disbelieve. And that's a lot of m what magic and d misdirecting and and uh, per, uh, all, all types of performing do do. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, one one note of caution. Reskinning is super fun, and. It can be really tempting as a DM to just start doing it all the time. I don't recommend that, and here's why. In any story where you go to another world, and especially a shared setting like the worlds of Dungeons and Dragons, there is a power, a, a really wonderful resonance when you meet things you're familiar with. And so what I like to do is mix in the unfamiliar with the familiar. I don't like take every single thing you're going to meet and it's, it's not working the way you expect it to. You might like you met an orc and it's a it's a vanilla orc. You met a hobgoblin, it's a vanilla hobgoblin. You know, then maybe the third, the fourth or the fifth mm. monster suddenly is the oh, yeah, it's unusual. Uh, it's that rule of threes that uh, uh, Chris Perkins and I, Chris Perkins and I talked about uh, on a Louis Chanel recently. Like, yeah, just yes. you gotta keep it. Um, but don't don't just do it that way all the time. Exactly. But even when you do the standard thing, remember that you can do memorable customization, not by changing anything in the stat block at all, but by giving the creature an interesting personality, mm -hmm. having it do interesting, scary, or funny things. Uh, I have seen players sort of sit up and pay attention in ways I haven't seen them do before when they simply see a familiar monster acting in a way that they're not used to. Uh, I also love role-playing 
uh, the monsters, making choices that feel natural for them, mm-hmm. rather than thinking, you know, sort of as the DM who has all the information at my fingertips, I often like to get into the psychology of the monster I'm playing. And if it's a monster, for instance, with a really low intelligence, I might have the monster make really bad choices uh, tactically in combat. Yeah, uh, I don't play all my monsters as tactical geniuses. And one reason I do that, going back to this idea of narrative variety, of narrative texture, because then it makes it when a tactical genius does show up, it makes them all the more terrifying. Right. Because suddenly when that hobgoblin warlord or that archmage or that cunning uh, cult leader or that genius dragon shows up who is outwitting, you know, all of your moves like a master chess player, it's far scarier if the players sort of get lulled into a little bit of a sense of uh, comfort by the by some of the creatures that are making really bad choices. Like they just fought three ogres who, you know, dropped rocks on their own heads and, yeah. you know, and, and, you know, allowed themselves to get surrounded, et cetera, et cetera. But here comes the the vampire lord and watch out. Yeah, because they, they don't make any of those mistakes. Exactly. What are your thoughts on, because I've heard a lot of people, uh, you know, or I've seen discussions like this on Twitter and other places uh, about rolling stats. Uh, so, you know, we, of course, in our in our stat blocks have the average hit point thing. And as I'm a lazy person, just as you are, so mm-hmm. I'll just sometimes use those. Uh, but I saw someone arguing for rolling hit points, not all the time, but, you know, when possible because of those variations you can all of a sudden have an ogre you're fighting is super you know high on that scale so then you immediately want to start describing it as bigger and larger and probably more terrifying or if for some reason it's a thin and you know scrappy ogre and how those even just hit point totals can inform small variants and choices and how they're portrayed so you as you so often do read my mind about sort of one of the next great places to dive into slight tweaks in a monster, Mm -hmm. and that is in hit points. Yeah, Uh, We provide a range of hit points in every monster on purpose. Uh, I've pointed out before that, yes, it's easy to use the average, because that number in the hit point, in the hit point line in the stat block, for anyone who doesn't know, that's the the average number of hit points for a creature of that type. Right. But right next to it in parentheses is a full range of hit points that uh, is possible for that monster. So I think it's a great idea if a DM wants some additional texture to actually roll up the hit points uh, for a particular monster. Now what I do as a DM is rather than doing that of rolling in advance or rolling you know, when the monster is encountered, I actually treat that hit point range as essentially a lever for me to adjust on the fly during combat. Oh, okay. Because what I will often do is I will I'll just get a sense of how is this combat going? Are people really digging it? Is it maybe, did they think it was going to be scary and maybe it's being a little easier than I thought? Well, I'll look down at the monster and I'll, and like here I'm looking at this Eidolon and it says, Uh, 63 hit points, but its hit point range allows for far more hit points than that. I might decide as they're getting close to wiping out all 63 of those hit points, I might decide, well, this one actually has 90 hit points, 100 hit points, uh, whatever feels dramatically appropriate. Mm. Uh, And that, that parentheses next to the hit points, every DM, when you look at that, remember that is there basically blinking to you, giving you permission to change the number of hit points. You can also go in the other direction. Sometimes a monster overstays its welcome. You might look down and, and, and see it says 95 hit points. I'm looking at the sacred statue. But uh, the creature actually could have uh, as few as 50 hit points. And if, if the fight is kind of like, eh, <laughs> that does happen. I mean, as awesome as D&D is, as fun as it, as it is, almost everyone at least once has been in that D&D fight where it's like, okay, we got it. Right. Uh, and the DM might look down and say, yeah, they've done 50 hit points. It's dead. It's gone. It's gone. There it goes. It topples over. Yeah, because that's, we, again, we present this range. Uh, the, the average is there for your convenience. The average is also there if you're being very... Uh, Uh, careful about encounter balance, which we've talked about in a different episode of Sage Advice. Uh, 
but I wouldn't worry too much as a DM about about some sort of abstract mathematical balance. What mm. is far more important is how is the fight feeling at the table? Right. Now, balance is a more important concern if you're doing design for other people. You know, you're writing an adventure for the DMs Guild and you want to make sure you get the encounter balance just right. But when you're DMing it for, when you're writing for yourself, you're preparing a monster for yourself or you're, or you're customizing it on the fly while you're DMing, the only people you have to please are your own players. Right. And so please, you know, I always say to DMs, don't be haunted by this abstract sense of I've got to be correct. Well, you know, there's I, Jeremy Crawford, am not lurking there as a spirit, you know, saying you did not follow a rule. <laughs> it's it. Uh, if my spirit was there, all it would be doing would be saying, have fun. <laughs> follow your bliss, man. Follow your bliss, man. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, and. And just make sure your players are having a good time. Yeah. Uh, and so, but that remember, having a good time doesn't always mean easy. So yeah, if something's overstayed, it's welcome. Uh, it has right. fewer hit points. But and that's something you kind of learn through experience, right? That's yes. The, that's much harder mm-hmm. for for newer DMs to to kind of gauge when is this when is this actually not being fun, or when is my my players might be give ho humming about stuff, but they're actually enjoying the fight. Right. And also remember, sometimes players want things to be hard. Right. Listen to your players because sometimes, especially if they know they're going to have a showdown with uh, a villain uh, or you know a big beast of some kind, listen to how they talk about it. If they're really psyching themselves up and they're kind of afraid, make sure it's not too easy for them unless it works narratively for it to be a big fake out. I mean, because mm. that can be a fun reveal, you know, where it's like, oh my God, you know, it's the terrifying thunder beast and you see the big shadow of it cast. And then as it comes around the corner, you see it's a little like miniature creature <laughs> that be, because of perspective, it, this the shadow was large and that can be a really funny moment. Even a small man can cast a big shadow. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, but most of the time when they're getting psyched up and they think it's gonna be scary, make sure it is and right. it, and and that that hit point range there that's a place where you can adjust on the fly and again no need for you to design a whole new stat block no need for you to recalculate the challenge rating just just change the hp within that range now you have another range to fool around with in uh in a monster stat block and that's the damage it deals mm. uh Monster damage, just like monster hit points, there's an average amount of damage printed, and then in parentheses next to it is the full range of that damage. I use this just like how I use the hit points. Uh, I, if I feel like, oof, this monster is, is wrecking them way more than I want, like I don't want them to get killed by this particular creature, if they're gonna die, it should be, you know, at the hands of the boss later. Right. I might, rather than using the average damage, uh, use an amount of damage that's on the lower end of that damage range. On the flip side, if the players maybe are getting a little cocky, they're shrugging off all the hits, well, then I go to the upper end of that range, and suddenly those hits are coming hard and terrifying. Right. Then other times, if I'm just kind of like, eh, it it could go either way. I'm I'm fine, and I, but I'm I'm not in the mood to use the average. Then I'll I'll actually roll the damage, uh, and I like to mix it up. Uh, there's no rule DM saying that if you start a combat using the average damage, you have to end the combat using the average damage. Mm. Uh, you might use it one round. You might roll the next. You might do max damage the next. You might do minimum damage the next. It's your call as a dungeon master uh, to create a field that's going to be enjoyable for the group and but that should always be your guiding guiding star our game's a co-op game no one wants the dm who's just out to annihilate everyone unless of course they're begging for a story about them being annihilated (laughs) uh you know it's you want you want there to be struggle but you don't want it to to be a source of despair at the table right well, you are you're getting dangerously dangerously close to a subject of uh, fudging dice. Mm, mm-hmm. um, so, uh, you know, should I press you on what your official opinion is on, on fudging <laughs> dice? Uh, sure. I mean, it, yeah, it, it's not about monster customization, but it is certainly related. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, as as pertains to hit points and and, right. and damage for sure. So, I as often as possible 
uh, like to stick with uh, whatever the dice tell me. Partly because as a DM, I love to be surprised. Mm. I I love that sense. Whenever I sit down at any table that I'm in, I'm DMing, I don't actually know what's going to happen because I don't know what the dice are going to say. Uh, you know, the dice can turn something I thought was going to be a cakewalk into, you know, a a, a life or death uh, struggle. Yeah. Uh, so that's why I like to mo- most of the time to stick to the dice, but occasionally. The dice will produce a result where I know, given the current mood at the table, if I went with that result, it would just go over like a lead balloon. Mm. Uh, and uh, that can, and when I do fudge, nine times out of ten, it is in the player's favor, uh, because the last thing I want is is a moment of freak randomness to skew the entire campaign in a way that's not going to be satisfying for the group. Mm. But don't misunderstand me. That doesn't mean I, I uh, shield uh, players from ever losing their characters. I mean, I, I have character death in my games, but I like to make sure that when it happens, it's going to be memorable. Right. And not, oh, she slipped climbing the ladder and fell and died. <laughs> <laughs> like, really? Here lies uh, <laughs> Olandria. Yes. yes, that character that you spent you know three days with me working on a backstory with, and now fell on the first adventure. Right, right. Yeah, I, I can I can see that, and I think that's that's a lot about gauging the room too, mm-hmm. like figuring out where you know if it's a new player or someone who's very invested in the character that they made together. You know, you might want to fudge it, and not a lot, but just enough to know, hey, there's danger here. You almost lost your character, and then you know here's how you can learn about. Uh, you know, h- h- how to not have that happen to your character in the future. Yeah. Now, w- sometimes I love making it impossible for myself to fudge rolls and will have players roll dice for me. Mm. Uh, this is something people can watch me do in Acquisitions Incorporated. Yeah. I will sometimes when I, w- I want the dice to determine what's going to happen, I'll have the players do it. Partly because as any DM will be able to attest, it's too tempting when you tell yourself, I'll just roll to see what's going to happen. But then you'll look at the die and think, I don't really like that result. Yeah. There, so there's something powerful about giving it to the players. Then you're all basically agreeing we are handing over the decision to fate. Right. Uh, and, uh, and I like doing that. Even, you, know, you can definitely have the players roll, but even just going from outside of the screen and yes. just rolling it yourself, but in their, in their full view uh, can have a lot of power. Now... <laughs> Uh, when I'm feeling uh, particularly impish as a DM, I like having the players do it, especially if it's something bad. Yeah, because then it's like, well, you did it. You rolled it. <laughs> exactly. I've got to do it now. <laughs> right. And because then then also they don't feel like the DM did that to me. Yeah. It's like, well, you rolled the die. <laughs> <laughs> and it's your lucky die that, that somehow turned the tide against you. Right. Yeah, right, I right. agree. I think that that is a that is extremely impish. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I mean, a lot of what you're saying makes a lot of sense to me as far as monster monster customization. Um, you know, I, I do this, you know, without without having had this conversation. I, I feel like I've I've uh, done this uh, for you know, uh, in my home game, I recently had a oh, I want to have a Medusa be a big bad, but they were all like level one or level two at the time. And I was like, ah, this is going to be a little bit harder than as written. So I think I just halved the the hit points and made some of the. Um, uh, snakes on uh, the the cursed woman's head not be eff- effective. Oh, perfect! Uh, and so yeah. you know the the um, paralyzation and st- and and uh, uh, what's it called the turning into stone uh, being uh, being petrified. Petrified. I was yeah. like not paralyzation. The other p word uh, just it wasn't as effective. Uh, so you know they had the danger of it happening, but it never actually you know uh, uh, occurred to them, and mm. they got to have a nice story moment mm-hmm. uh, and uh, and defeat the gorgon. Uh, but um, but yeah, and it's, it was a wonderful tool. It was a very memorable fight. But they weren't necessarily uh, fighting against something that would be, you know, more appropriate for higher levels. And you just described something uh, I love with monster customization, and that is when you take something familiar, like a Medusa, or I, I've seen DMs do it with mind flayers, mm. and you don't reskin them. Like you actually put them into the game, and like this Medusa is actually a Medusa, or this mind flayer is actually a mind flayer. But you want a lower level party to face them i love it when the reduced power is 
justified by in-world description. Yeah. The thing is injured. Uh, you can see the marks of some, you know, fell magic upon it. Uh, then that shows players the D&D world is alive. Not every monster of a particular type is identical. Yeah. Uh, you know, you there are actually weak versions of these things, and there are also more powerful versions of these things. Because really the stat blocks are, are sort of like a, a platonic ideal of the particular monster. Yeah. But that doesn't mean every individual of that species uh, is the same. Uh, it's really, each of these is a starting point for the dungeon master. Now, when it comes to more concrete customization. So we've talked about just describe it differently. Mm -hmm. Then we've talked about sort of light on the fly changes. Now let's talk a little bit about actually digging in and changing some of the game mechanics. Mm. But again, this is for you DMs out there who are gonna join us in being lazy. Uh, and <laughs> This is the non-lazy version. Well, so this is still, I'm gonna encourage uh, uh, as little work as possible. So if you want to actually ch uh, make a new monster or heavily customize a monster, I'd say your starting point should still be monsters that already exist. Because we have designed now so many stat blocks between the Monster Manual, Volo's Guide, Morden Kanan's Tome of Foes, all the stat blocks that appear in our adventures. Plunder those DMs. Go mm -hmm. through those stat blocks and see, is there something close to what you want? Yeah. But let's say it's not quite close enough. You find a stat blocker, it's like, well, it's halfway there. And so just simple reskinning isn't gonna get me to the target. Maybe you need to swap out a few of the attacks or you want to change a trait or two of the monster. What I recommend is basically merge monsters. Look for several monsters that have the characteristics you want especially if they're around the same challenge rating. And just like, if you're like, oh, I like this ability in this monster that's CR3, and I like this ability in this other monster that's CR3, let's see about putting them together. Mm. Uh, especially if you're bringing in uh, different attacks that, that require your whole action, often you're not, you're not gonna break anything be right. because the monster still has to spend its whole action doing this thing. You have to be more careful when you start bringing in traits that might suddenly modify everything the monster is doing, or you suddenly make a monster legendary that wasn't legendary before. There, you're going to need to proceed with more caution. But if you're simply saying, oh, I wanted a, a different attack option, and I'm pulling it from a monster with, a, with the same or a very close CR, that's usually good enough. Yeah. Uh, also, if the monster is a spellcaster, uh, please remember, DMs, if you haven't read the introduction of the Monster Manual, we encourage you swap out spells. Uh, the, especially in the monsters that have the spellcasting trait, those are really just that list of spells. Those are suggestions. Yeah, they could be anything. Yeah. And, and, and so. The power levels of spells is, you know, it, as long as it's in the same level, you, you can swap out whatever you want. Exactly. Uh, spells also, because. Uh, they already their power level is worked out are a great place also to loot. Let's say uh, I want I want a CR one creature to be able to breathe fire, uh, but I'm uh, I'm not sure how much damage I want it to deal. You could just have it uh, use burning hands, uh, but just treat it as a breath weapon instead of uh, a spell, and okay. and and just. Basically, take the work we've already done for you of figuring out what this first level spell should do damage-wise mm -hmm. uh, and and just do that. Would you have it recharge on a five and a six? Uh, it, it would depend on its, it would depend on its uh, CR. And here we get a little more technical. Yeah. Uh, if, it's, if it's essentially a, a, if it's a CR one or higher creature and... I don't expect any creature to last longer than about three rounds. Uh, I would probably let it, if I was just ad hocing it, I would just let it do burning hands each round. Just sort of treat it like a spellcaster. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, but wouldn't, it, that, wouldn't that mean they would have three spell slots? 
Yeah. At that but, level. But uh, many of our lower level creatures would. Oh, okay. uh, now, yeah. to be fair, if I was getting super technical, that's that's a bit too generous for CR1. Yeah. But again, we're not uh, we're not talking about design for an official adventure. We're talking about is design. What feels fun. Feels fun for you as a DM. Because when you're designing for yourself, you can course correct on the fly. Yeah. If you're like, ooh, this is a little too powerful, well, then just it, it right. doesn't do it a third time. And it breathed fire on itself, and now it's dead. Right. <laughs> now, now, one reason I chose uh, Burning Hands, and, and there are a number of first-level spells that are good for looting when you want something for a monster to do, uh, because most of them are quite limited in their effect. Burning Hands, for instance, it's a great spell, but its range is actually really short. Yeah. This is not like a dragon's breath weapon that is you know, this Huge. massive cone that can easily incinerate an entire party of adventurers. It's a little 15-foot cone. And if you're, if you're keeping your distance from the creature, it's often pretty easy to avoid it. Yeah. Uh, if you have a tactically minded kind of party. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, no, I've seen groups where it's like, wow, do you guys really want to bunch up like that? Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Sounds great. Yeah, here yeah. it comes. I had a group recently who played a fought against the uh, Yellow Ochre, and it was, uh, 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 you know, Three, three party members, and they almost all died. <laughs> wow. <laughs> to a yellow ochre, the ochre jelly. <laughs> Sorry, ochre jelly. Uh, yes, that was fun. And I'm and so I'm glad, by the way, you mentioned the ochre jelly. Uh, this, th this is actually segueing back toward uh, just sort of reskinning something. Mm. Uh, but I once, you know, remember I gave you that example of, oh, you have to dance with the tentacle thing with a bunch of eyes. <laughs> that um, was an ochre jelly? It, well, it wasn't a dance scene. It was actually fighting. Uh, but I wanted a big sort of Lovecraftian tentacled thing with eyes with sort of corrosive qualities. And so I just, you know, opened up my monster manual. I'm like, I, I don't need to create a new stat block for this. You know, just went, Use the went to the oozes. Oh, and it actually wasn't the ochre jelly. It was the black pudding. Ah. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, then I because it has the split ability. And so, you know, I could have tentacles falling off and forming up new bunches of yeah. tentacles. Uh, yeah, DMs, remember, you're not bound by the the visual descriptions that are here when you want to create something new. Yeah. Uh, now, if you want to get even more technical, going back to digging into the nitty gritty of of customizing a monster's abilities, if you really your your bliss is you're going to really dig in, then we get into a realm that goes well beyond what we could cover in this podcast and, and that is, you're going to want to go to the Customizing a Monster section in the Dungeon Master's Guide. Uh, because we've joked before, the Dungeon Master's Guide is the... Is, is the amalgam of everything that couldn't fit in the other books. Yes, <laughs> and, and it's always filled with like these treasures that a lot of people don't know are, are, are there. Yeah. And, and many people don't know we have an entire section in the Dungeon Master's Guide on creating your own monster uh, or modifying a monster. And here we go into step-by-step figuring out, pardon me, armor class, hit points, the amount of damage the creature deals. Does it have resistances? Uh, that is all here. We also give you a framework for estimating the monster's challenge rating. Mm -hmm. All of that. Uh, we also uh, give a big table of different uh, monster features that are great to reuse. Uh, things like legendary resistance, keen senses, the imp's invisibility ability. It's kind of a shopping list of, hey, DM, uh, you're looking for different things a monster might do. Hey, go to page 280 in your Dungeon Master's Guide, and there is a big table of different monster features that we designed to be lootable. We loot these in our, in our own monster design. It mm. is actually one of our internal design directives that whenever possible, when designing a new monster, if we've already created a trait in another monster that does exactly what the new monster should do, always use the old trait yeah. uh, if it's appropriate. Why make up something new if it's already there and play tested and, and tried and true? Exactly. And that's also, uh, we have that principle for the sake of our DMs because if you're a DM and you read it and you're like, oh, I've run this, this feature before, then you can focus on the thing that's new in the monster yeah. and not have to read every single word carefully and then suddenly realize, wait, this is exactly the same as this other thing that I'm already familiar with, but you know, it, it, it just has slightly different wording. Interesting. Yeah, that's uh, true. Uh, we also give you advice on creating uh, monsters with classes, 
uh, creating NPCs uh, of different monstrous species. All of that is is here uh, in in the Dungeon Master's Guide. This isn't going to get you to exactly the CR calculations or the exact numbers that people see in our books, because in our books we use a big spreadsheet uh, that we use to design the entire game that calculates uh, the numbers very precisely. Uh, the material in the Dungeon Master's Guide is an approximation of what's in that spreadsheet, and 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 it gives you close enough uh, to to you know where you want to go, especially with uh, for your own game. For your home game. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Because this advice is here for you as a dungeon master to, if you want to say, make a monster from scratch uh, and it's going to, you know, be a stat block you're going to reuse mm -hmm. uh, in a campaign. Uh, we give you a lot of technical advice here. I don't recommend using this uh, unless there's just not a monster. Right. A anywhere in the game that's like what you want. Only, only go into doing that when you've exhausted the other topics we've already discussed exactly like reskinning or yeah or, or picking and choosing certain things then you, if you were like well none of those really fit i want to create my own monster or if it's your bliss to just create your own monster you know and spend the time doing that you know that's that's probably the best place to start yeah and uh, another uh, uh area of easy customization to keep in mind is mm -hmm. especially when you're running humanoids remember you can swap out their weapons you can change what they're wearing and that can have a meaningful impact. I do that often. I will take, I might take a goblin stat block, but it's like, but this group of goblins has different weapons than you know what's in the stat block. Ah, okay. Um, yeah, that's an easy thing to do. Yeah, so, but here's the thing: if I'm pressed for time and I don't want to look up the other weapons, because I actually, I love uh, violating my own notes when I'm running my game. Like I'll decide a bunch of things beforehand, and then in the moment I'll be like, Nah, I'm going to do something else. That's for fun. Yeah, just for fun. Yeah. So I might on the spot decide, no, oh, they don't have javelins. They have scimitars. But you know what? If I don't have time, I don't want to, like, I don't want my Look players. Up scimitars. To, I'm, you know, looking it up or, you know, I can't remember. I might actually use the exact same number that's in the stat block. And just describe them as scimitars. Exactly. That seems to be the theme of what yes. this is, is don't redo work that's already done for you. Yep. Yeah. You know. And now someone listening would be like, but Jeremy, you know, one of what the new weapon might have a property the old weapon, you know, lacks or uh, you know, the the damage range might be different. But remember, it's a range. And as long as the amount of damage that the monster is dealing is, you know, the it's still a number that's possible in either weapon's range. We're good. Yeah. The, pl the players don't know. That's uh, true. There there are no rules police. You know, lurking over your shoulder to see what did you I'm do still, there. I'm DM? still waiting for that spirit of Jeremy Crawford <laughs> uh, 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 with that, that no. the gift from Acquisitions Incorporated <laughs> with you wagging the finger. That's that's what I picture that spirit looks like. Yeah. Well, I mean, because really, really, if if again my spirit was there, and and if a DM, it's much more Cheech and Chong like than the, <laughs> the wagging the finger. Yeah, no, my my spirit would be like again, have fun, man. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> I love that. I love that. Well, thank you so much yeah. for, for coming on and talking all about uh, monster customization. Uh, I always love uh, these conversations. We get we get into the nitty gritty, and I, and I, and I really enjoy that. Yeah, as do I. Thanks for having me. How can people have more, uh, if they have more questions uh, about, about rules or about this topic or any other? Uh, people can reach me on Twitter. I'm Jeremy E. Crawford there. Uh, recently, I've been doing so much writing that I've been... A little absent on Twitter, but I do still poke my head in, and if I if I have some spare minutes, I uh, can uh, quickly answer some questions. Nice. Uh, and if you haven't checked it out, uh, do so. Uh, Jeremy Crawford's uh, uh, Dungeon Mastering for Actors Incorporated, the PAX East game. Uh, people have been been telling me wonderful, wonderful things, and it's on my queue of things to watch. I have not yet been able to do it, uh, but going through the world of Ravnica, it seems like it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, it's been bonkers. Uh, and uh, and we'll be at D and D live yes. uh, in May, May seventeenth, yeah. eighteenth, nineteenth. You'll be dungeon mastering there. Uh, I'm very excited about that. Yeah, I am too. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you, and we'll we'll have you on again soon. Great. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye. We're staying on schedule. <laughs> <laughs> we only got one minute left, so we're going to throw it uh, directly to uh, Bidwin Plays uh, and Scott Kurtz uh, and uh, Corey playing through some fun Idol Champions of the Forgotten Realms. So thanks again, Jeremy, uh, for coming on. Uh, and uh, let's uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be back uh, next week with some more fun 
uh, Dragon Talk recordings. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.